Today we're going to be talking about how there's really no word-for-word translation. But Jesus guarantees that through all the mess-ups and all the stuff that we do, His words will last forever. And I will be talking about some certain words that I have issues with. Today on Coffee with Conrad. Conrad Rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Rocks of revelation being poured out to you. My passion is for you to have that spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus, a spiritual relationship with the biblical God. Jesus says that no man can get to the Father but by him. And when I think about that, I also think about how Jesus is the Word from John chapter 1. You know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God. I also think about how God the Father is a spirit, and those that worship Him must, M-U-S-T, worship Him in spirit and in truth, John 4.24. So when we're meditating on the words of Jesus Christ, we are kind of... uh, Look at it this way. We're wading in to the Spirit of God like Ezekiel's river. You know, we're getting our feet wet and our knees. We're we're getting into it, and pretty soon we'll be enraptured with the Spirit and the Word of God. But the Word, I find it interesting. Jesus is the way to the Father. Jesus is also the Word. So when we meditate on the Word, we're going towards the Father. That's awesome to think about. But what happens if these words are changed? or perverted somehow. What do we do? You are having coffee with Conrad on ConradRocks.net. One of the things that I've learned in my studies, and I'm in no way an expert, I'm not a linguist at all. I'm just a guy that loves the Word of God, that sits in his closet and podcasts every once in a while. But one of the things that i found is that the original Old Testament was written in Hebrew, And there have been some translations along the way. One of them was the Greek Septuagint. The other was the Latin Vulgate. And hundreds of years later, people are trying to translate it into English. And sometimes they'll be taking a translation of a translation, and it gets a little messed up. In an earlier podcast, I talked about how Tyndale was actually burned at the stake as a heretic for translating the Bible into English. But in my studies, I was seeing the biggest problem was how he translated the word ecclesia into congregation or assembly. And that more accurately reflects the truth of what the word was in the original Greek. And, you know, I found out along my journey of studying the Bible that there's really no word for word translation from any one language to another. It just that's just not how it works. And I'm kind of surprised that that's not common knowledge. Um, there are some people that I, I know today that think that it's a word, you know, for if there's a word in Italian, it's going to be the same exact meaning in English. It's just going to be a different word. That's not how it works. And I, you know, I really didn't know that for a while. For some reason, I just thought all languages were, they just had different words for the same thing. For instance, I know that cat in English was gato in Spanish. So I thought every word worked that way. But that's not how it works. You know, that I thought there was just one word for one thing in each language. And I pretty much thought that language was like that when I was a child. But when I grew up, you know, I heard things like, hey, there's 20 different words for snow by Eskimos. Now, I don't know if that's correct, but the principle still holds true. Basically, the Eskimos have a lot more value for snow. They have a, a reason. They have, you know, different... Uh, types of definitions for different types of snow. Is it going to stick? Is it slushy? What color is it? You know, I don't know how they define it. But when we hear the word in America on the mainland, we just think of snow as snow. But these are the things that we find in our English language. You know, and I know that you probably heard this before. There's a few different Greek words that are translated as love in English. Agape, phileo, and eros are the ones that come to mind. And they all mean something a little bit different. However, in English, we only use the word love. We don't have brotherly love. We don't have unconditional love. We don't have erotic love. 
So loosely translating these can be can lead somewhat to a problem. Think of make love, not war. What were the hippies saying back then? Okay, so let's also consider homonyms, which are two words that are spelled exactly the same, but they have uh, two different meanings, like pole, like the North Pole, or a pole, like in a fire station, right? And also, I was reading a blog the other day with the word content in it, and uh, it was really meant to be to be content. But my eyes, you know, I was tired, and they spun a little bit because I was thinking content. And I just assumed that I knew the definition of the word, and I just assumed that I knew what the author was saying. And it really did change how I was perceiving the blog post. I had to back up and re-examine my thoughts. So now, imagine the confusion that can happen if you're trying to take a word that was originally in Hebrew, and then translated into Greek, and then maybe even into Latin, and then finally into English, right? And remember in this earlier podcast, I was talking about how a lady, she was teaching a class and she was using a contemporary dictionary for the English word and like the New King James Version for a word that was spoken in Hebrew thousands of years ago. So I found a problem with that. And then look at how words change in our lifetime. You know, Susan and I would do this, this daily Bible plan and she likes to read along with the, the audio version of you version. And sometimes the words in the, in the written text will be different from what the guy says. I think one of them is Noff and uh, it'll actually be Memphis. I get it confused, but I think it says Memphis in the text and he says Noff in the audio. So you see how things change. I often kid with Susan about how sick doesn't mean not well anymore. It means cool, you know, and cool. It's kind of funny because cool doesn't just mean not hot anymore. It now means neat, you know, and neat no longer means tidy. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It means cool. So words can change even in our, our lifetimes. So you can see how we're trying to apply these contemporary definitions to words which were written hundreds or even thousands, well, actually thousands of years ago in a different language. Yes, we got to have the Spirit of God. So when I learned this, I, I'm not an expert, like I said, but I got my, myself a strong concordance, man. And I'm trying to get as close to the original autographs as I can. And it's an amazing journey every time I do that. I do believe, like I said, I'm not an expert, but I do believe I stumbled across something that people need to be aware of in their Bible reading. You know, here's a, here's a couple of verses I want to read to you. Um, Matthew 5.18. This is something interesting. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. In Matthew twenty four thirty five, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now, what I find amazing about these passages is even though they're in English, we get the essence of what they mean. Basically, God is looking over his word to make sure that we have it, it would be impossible, I believe, except for God. And no matter what happens in heaven and earth, heaven and earth can pass away. Somehow God is going to make sure that we have the word of God. And, uh, you know, we have all these translations. We have all these versions. I mean, how many versions of the truth can there be? And somehow in the midst of all that, I believe God has preserved his word. I remember there was this passage in the Old Testament where the word of God was pretty much non-existent. And some priest found the scroll and he read the Torah to the king. And the king was so moved that he rent his clothes the king's heart was so swayed that he established the law of God in the land in 2 Kings 22. Here's the passage I'm going to read to you. It's in 2 Kings 22, verses 8 through 13. And forgive me when I mispronounce names. <laughs> I'm so used to reading stuff, I don't know how they sound in real life, you know. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king, and brought the king word again, and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house, and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work. 
that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest had delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Azahiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go ye, inquire the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. So you see that even though the word of God seemed to have disappeared for a while, I mean, this was the high priests and scribes and stuff, and they found the book of the law. I mean, how are they high priests and scribes without the book of the law? See, that's a little puzzling to me. But God used that king in that time. It was preserved. God used someone that sought the word of God. And that's why you and I, that's what you and I are doing today. We're seeking the truth, and we're digging deeper, and we're going higher with God. Now, I'm thinking... This, this might have been the original copy because of the way it was worded. You know, this might have been the original copy of the Pentateuch kept beside the ark or in the ark in Deuteronomy 31, 24, 24 through 26. It could have been hidden during the reigns of Manasseh and Ammon because they turned against the Lord. Who knows? We know that he read Deuteronomy by his reaction, Deuteronomy 27 to 28, you know, the blessings and the curses, and that the king highly esteemed these and knew to repent. He knew to repent. So even during the Dark Ages, there were original transcripts that were copied. You know, they were handed down to us. And it's been said that if we lost all the Bibles on the planet, that we could recreate the Bible simply by quoting the Anti-Nicene Fathers. And what I find amazing is how God actually preserved His Word through, through the Dark Ages. You know, I think the Irish monks, they faithfully transcribed a lot of history books and a lot of the Word of God. If we believe Jesus and we believe what he said, we're going to know that somehow the original words of God are preserved. Now, people have put forth the claim that it doesn't really matter what translation that you read because the original message somehow gets through. Well, I'm going to have to kind of disagree with that, and I'll show you why. I'm going to discuss a couple of things that I found with you about how I believe we need to be aware of the original Greek and Hebrew. And I'm going to show you the difference between a couple of translations here. One of them is the Message Bible. Now, the Message Bible does not claim to be a literal translation from the Bible. It claims to be a paraphrase, but how do people use it? They use it as the Bible, not like a commentary. Now, here's what the wiki says. The Message Bible the message, the Bible, in contemporary language, was created by Eugene H. Peterson and published in segments from 1993 to 2002. It is an idiomatic translation of the original languages of the Bible, unquote. I get that. The only problem is people think it's the Bible. They don't think of it like as a commentary. Now, I have heard whole sermons on YouTube taught out of the Message Bible translation, and it made my blood boil because I knew that it was completely wrong. Now, let me give you an example. Isaiah 28, 10, and 11. If you don't believe me, you can check this out. You can get your message Bible. Look at Isaiah 28, 10, and 11. Here's the King James. For a precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Now, like I said, this may blow your mind, but you can verify this online. It's not hard to verify. Here is what the message says for Isaiah 28.10, and I'm not joking. Da, 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 blah, 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 blah. That's a good little girl. That's a good little boy. But that's exactly how you will be addressed. God will speak to his people in baby talk, one syllable at a time. So what can I say here? Beware of the scribes. You are digging deeper with Conrad on conradrocks.net. So these don't sound anything remotely s- similar. You know, should a message Bible even be allowed in church? I mean, really? <laughs> Come on, should we even have that? <sighs> 
So this is a paraphrase from a person that was interpreting the original text for whatever mood they happened to be in at the time. I'm not really sure if I would want to stand on a paraphrase. It's almost like calling a commentary inspired, you know? We know commentaries could have been inspired at the moment, but we don't ever, we don't revere it on the same level as the Bible. That's like the Jews treating the Talmud or usurping the Talmud over the Tanakh. In other words, they were valuing the traditions and revelations of man over the original autographs of the Word of God. Jesus was consistently chiding them about that. Remember, he kept saying, it is written, and he's chiding the Pharisees for using or exalting their traditions over the Word? Just remember that. I'm sure you can remember several examples. Now, exploring this further, let's talk about the NIV a little bit. Beware of the scribes, right? The NIV leaves out some important passages as compared to the King James Version. And before I go on with this, I want you to know I'm not a King James only guy. I have issues with words that I found in the King James. So I'm not a King James only guy. I just want to make sure that you're aware of what I'm about to tell you. Here are some verses that the NIV leaves out of the Bible. This is left out of the King James. I mean, the NIV leaves these verses out. Matthew 17, 21. How be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Okay, so the NIV doesn't want you to know that a demon goes out. A tougher demon goes out by prayer and fasting, right? Matthew 18, 11. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Matthew 23, 14. Now these are left out in the NIV. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Mark seven sixteen. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Mark nine forty four. Where their worm dieth not, in the fire is not quenched. So here I see that the NIV in in Mark nine forty six. It's, both of these are taken out, man. It says, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Jesus repeats himself in Mark 94, 944 and 946. So for some reason, they don't want us to know that the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. And you'll notice that there's this popular doctrine like there is no hell. <laughs> you know, so where does that come from? Mark eleven twenty six is taken out in the NIV Bible. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So why do they not want us to know about forgiveness? Mark 15, 28. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So these are only eight verses that are left out of the King James. You know, they're left out in the NIV Bible, but they're in the King James. The fundamental difference here is the NIV comes from what they call the Masoretic text, if I remember that correctly. Um, And the King James comes from the Texas Receptus, or the majority text. But in either event, you know, whoever happens to be right in this, you've got to see that there's a disparity. Okay? I don't care if you like NIV or if you like King James, you've got to say, hey, there's a problem here. And like I said, in Matthew 7, 21, it's like the NIV doesn't want you to know that there are certain types of demons that only come out by prayer and fasting. I don't know about you, but that's going to affect my theology. Now, it w- will not only affect my intellectual theology, but it will it will affect my everyday life. So we need to know that fasting and prayer is paramount in deliverance. Now, a really good book that digs into the difference in Bible versions is a book called New Age Bible Versions by Gail Ripplinger. You may not find this book in the Christian bookstores. Just warning you. But you can find a few videos of her talking about this subject on YouTube, and you will be blown away. You can also find some documents about the New Age Bible versions on Scribd. Now, Scribd is where I do a lot of my research. It's an unlimited ebook and audio book uh, service, kind of like Netflix for books. And I want to encourage you to try Scribd. If you listen to me, I'm going to give you a link in my show notes where you can get two months for free. They normally offer one. But if you're listening to Conrad Rocks, you're going to get two months for free. 
Scribd is, like I said, Scribd is where I do a lot of my research. It has many people uploading documents, too, that are a great value in my studies. And it's under 10 bucks a month right now if you do decide to subscribe. It's greatly, greatly worth it. So anyway, again, that's for a thank you for listening to Conrad Rocks. Now, I'm going to be talking about some words that I have issues with in the next podcast. I want to thank you for being in my life. Until we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.